And not a very smooth start here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then it went to the wrong desktop. Cool. All right. So you should be able to see. Welcome. The webinar will begin at the top of the hour. Very first thing that we want to talk about here, and Jerry, if you just want to give me a thumbs up, if you see slides and just ensure everything's working, perfect. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items for you to be aware of as we start the webinar. First off, uh, throughout the webinar, we hope you guys have questions, and, uh, and we would love to answer some of those questions for you at the end of the webinar. To ask those questions, use the Q&A tool. You can see a little screenshot of it there. Um, so if you find the Q&A button uh, down uh, in Zoom, then you can ask your questions here, and even better, you can upvote other people's questions. And so if you see a question that's interesting to you, then hit the upvote button. And typically what I do is I just start, when we get into Q&A, we just start with the most upvoted questions. So that way we can answer stuff that, uh, that kind of impacts the most people. Um, second thing is a lot of you are already doing this, but we would love for you to join in on the discussion during the webinar. If you switch this from just all panelists, you switch that to all panelists and all attendees, that will make sure that your chats go to everybody. And so that way you guys can chat with not just us, but you can chat with each other as well, which I think is, uh, is a lot of fun. And Jerry, you did hit the record button. So yes, the webinar is being recorded. Yep, two thumbs up, so we're good to go there. And this will be posted to our YouTube channel as well as the webinars page at ekahow.com once the webinar is done. So quick introduction. Um, so the topic today is why all high density Wi-Fi isn't the same. And uh, to talk about this, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got three of us here on the call to talk about this. First off is uh, Jerry, our product manager here at Ekahow. I don't know, Jerry, do you want to say hey or something? Hey. There we go. Yeah. There's Jerry. <laughs> That's all you need to do. That. That's all you need from me. That's Jerry. And I'll be, uh, I'll be probably mostly uh, maintaining, uh, you know, Q&A and chat. Uh, so yeah, as Joel mentioned, make sure you're leveraging that and I'll uh, interact with you guys there. Nice. And of course, me, my name is Joel. I'm the technical trainer here at Eka Howe. And we also have a very, very special guest with us today. And his name is Jim Palmer. Uh, Jim is uh, CWNE and uh, he's a wireless network engineer at Insert Airport name here. Uh, and uh, there's Jim's uh, Twitter there as well, if you want to connect with him on Twitter. So, Jim, do you want to introduce yourself at all, or did I pretty much take care of it? Pretty much there. I mean, the airport thing is sort of a running joke now, but I'm still not officially allowed to say it, but it, everybody pretty much knows. But It is an airport. Got it. And uh, yes. Do we, so, do we no, need to no. specify anything uh, about the cookies? Oh yeah. What? Okay. Jim, what is it with the cookies? I mean, what, what is with the cookies? You know, it's, it's yes. Lots of cookies. It's actually kind of funny because it all started. It was, it's Eddie Ferrero's fault. You know, Hey Eddie from the bad five fame, which I think we get to in a little bit. Um, he stopped by the office one day cause he knows where we sit and, uh, and we were, I was showing off my little spectrum analyzer, the field fox. And so he was taking pictures of it. And one of the guys in the office had brought some pistachio Oreos in and we took the picture the pistachio Oreos were in the background. And so he tweets it out and he goes, he goes, Hey everybody, look what Jim has. That's right. Pistachio Oreos. It doesn't, doesn't mention anything about this big giant, you know, spectrum analyzer in the foreground of the picture. And so the whole thing just sort of takes off from there about Oreos. And so Eddie's, you know, with Eddie's help and, you know, and other people would come to the, I think, uh, Jerry, you've been by and had some Oreos. <laughs> well, yeah. The peanut we, butter ones. Those are good. Do you just so, always have Oreos on hand for when, when people come and visit you at work? You know, we didn't used to, but now it's almost, it's now it's become like a, an obligation now. So like when I was at tech field day a couple of weeks ago, um, I took Oreos to everybody. We had uh, carrot cake Oreos. And so, um, in honor of you having me on your guys's webinar, I'd like to, I brought some, um, I brought some sandwich cookies with me and this is an, this is an, an official announcement of an unofficial Eka How product. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Jerry and I don't even know what this is just so everyone's aware. We work at Eka How and we don't know that there's a new product being announced. So, so, so yeah, so if in, in, it's a limited run, limited edition, you got to know where to find it. But if you look, you can actually find the Eka cookie. <laughs> So limited time, you know, and, and, and they're, you know, of course, because we designed good Wi-Fi, you know, it's, it's green. So we got, we got some good green sandwich cookies, you know, so limited edition. Um, I tried to, I tried to get uh, Lee 
on board with this. Lee didn't want it. So I got an extra one. If somebody wants it, um, licensing, you get free licensing for like 20 minutes and then I come take it back from you. Um, but it's all, no, all I have a cards, question. So. Jim, is that cookie actually edible? Well, yeah, I just technically, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, you, sticker. Look, you, no, it's tape because nothing would huh. stick to the damn cookie. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. So, wow. There you go. I got, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Jim Palmer. <laughs> Look, if Chris is going to come on unannounced and be a, you know, get credit, I got to do something funny. I guess, so. I, I guess that is true. Well, <laughs> Jim, we're, we're, ex we're really excited to have you here today because uh, I think, uh, well, the entertainment value alone is, uh, is definitely worth it. But uh, also, I think we've got a good topic today, too. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to talk about the uh, agenda and what kind of what we're going to talk about on this one? Um, yeah, I can talk about that. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the origination of this topic was around actually around Cisco Live and around, you know, the idea that oh, there's a lot of traffic at Cisco Live. There's a you know, bunch of APs. There's a bunch of people. There's a lot of traffic. And, and it was funny because I started to compare what I was doing at an airport with what was happening at Cisco Live. And it was interesting to take, kind of take a look at the numbers and go, you know, they're both, you could classify as high density, but the way we accomplish it is so different. And it boils down to a lot of the things that's on the screen, you know intent based networking is actually what's the intent of the users. You know, I think a lot of times we forget that at the end of the day, our job is to deliver videos or content to people's devices. I, I, we have a test in our office called the Vic test and that's a Victoria can watch vi uh, videos of baby goats on her phone. If she can, then the Wi-Fi passes. If Vic can't watch videos of baby goats, then the Wi-Fi fails. Cause at the end of the day, that's really what it is. Vic's intent as part of the network is to watch, you know, you know, the baby goats and other people have different things. So it's a question of you, know, what is the intent? And then once you understand that stuff, it's like, okay, how do we do that? How do we replicate that? How do we mock that up? You know, because in certain areas you don't have years to plan and other times you do. And so that's kind of, you know, how we plan, how we can model and then how we can accomplish some of the things, um, especially with external antennas. Um, I think, one of the rec one of the numbers I heard said that there's like 95% of all the APs manufactured are external or internal antennas and and you know and I joke around and say well the other five percent we buy because because <laughs> you're your, your we're seventy we're seventy percent external antennas wow. wow and so it's a it's you know and so a lot of people have questions around designing with external antennas how hard is it you know and this it takes so much time is something that we're going to cover and I want to kind of go over and so and you're. And you're fairly recent to, you know, the, the CWNE, but you're no uh, uh, new person to the uh, RF space, right? You've been uh, in that uh, industry for a while. Yeah, I've, um, I actually started in radios out of, out of high school in the Army. And so when I, I've been doing 20 years of radio work, two-way radios, uh, air-to-ground radios, you know, the walkie-talkies and stuff. I've been doing that for 20 years, got bored and said, hey, what's this Wi-Fi thing? And so literally it's been coming up on seven years that I, I switched over to do Wi-Fi and, and I did pretty well just based on my RF knowledge. My networking knowledge is questionable. Um, but it turns out if you can, if you can get to some good RF going, you can, you can overcome a lot of networking shortcomings, especially if you have a team to back you up, which luckily I do. So that's where my background is, is more of, I started as a radio guy and now I'm learning network. Awesome. Well, um, towards the end of the webinar here, we'll, like we mentioned earlier, we'll have a Q and a section. I think we can cross the, the cookies thing off yeah. check. Well, I think that yeah. is done. Well, no, so. don't cross, just the maybe part. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So, so not maybe cookies. There will be, there's cookies. There, there will be, and there was cookies. So <laughs> right. yeah. So. And they're special cookies too. That's right. <laughs> they're special <laughs> cookies. Cool. <laughs> so Jim, I'm just going to drive slides here and just kind of let you let you talk and I don't know, maybe we'll ask some questions and things like that, but I think it's going to be pretty free form. And so, um, so I don't know, do you want to, I think I'll just let you take it away. Click, uh, click, click next on that one, Jill. Oh, is Let's there a next there? This is what hap oh there's I did, this is what happens when I did not build this particular slide so yeah. group group slide building <laughs> yeah it's great but, but I yeah, added so, this is my contribution what the animation <laughs> oh I thought 
I thought your uh, contribution was putting a uh, uh, putting a, a screw right through the middle of the AP. <laughs> that sounds like something Jerry would do. So I just wanted to clarify. You know, this is when we're talking about temporary installs. This is not the uh, the proper uh, temporary install that we're referring to. Yeah. So what what is a what is a proper temporary install? Well, let's go to the next slide, and we can actually look at a proper temporary install. All right. So what we're looking at here. Oh, look, there's a new picture that wasn't there 10 minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> what we're looking at here is um, some different things that we've collected as far as, you know, between super temporary and going to, you know, just very, very temporary. Um, you know, the, the picture on the left was actually from uh, when I was going through Spain last fall. And it literally looks a lot like you would think as a temporary the antennas would tell me it's that's somewhat temporary because I'd never do that, but um, it that's literally their their permanent installation, and that's how just how they the aesthetics did it there in, in Madrid, and then you go to the center picture with the Wi-Fi stand one, obviously atmosphere, you know that is the very temporary. That is hey we're coming you know we're coming in hot and heavy. We're gonna deploy this thing in in a minute. It's gonna be there for a couple of days and then it's coming out. And then the stuff on the right is actually a little bit of a hybrid mix. It, this is some pictures of some stuff that we have down in one of my storage rooms of a temporary deployment that uses the stands that they use in like convention booths that holds up the, the, uh, the curtains and everything. And it has a big heavy base and, and we have these things staged and ready to go. And when somebody says, hey, I need coverage here, then we just grab the mast, we grab the heavy base, and we go out and we slap it down and, and you know, figure out how we're going to get the backhaul done. And, and we get a temporary install that we've had up in some places. We had them up there for, you know, six, eight months. And so there's... So, so Jim, at like at uh, insert airport name here, what are the, like, like, what are the use cases for like a temporary install like that? Like, so what, what, you know, in what scenario do you temporarily need Wi-Fi at some place like an airport concourse? Well, it, it, there's more to the airports than the concourses. I mean, we have public what? spaces. Um, yeah, I know. Um, if you come to this undisclosed location, you can play miniature golf um, for free for the next month or so. And so all of a sudden they pop these things up on us and they go, you know, Hey, here's this thing. Um, come September, October, we have a beer garden that you can go and sample beers at. And so what happens is just like everything else, they go come up with these great ideas and they go, Oh, but now we need Wi-Fi there. Um, you know, a serious example was, um, actually the Japanese earthquake from five or six years ago. The, uh, and the Fukushima reactors melted down and they evacuated all the Amel uh, American military people and their dependents out of Japan. And they had to fly them somewhere. And this was one of the places that they landed. And so we actually had to set up a temporary military receiving spot in an empty hangar. And all of a sudden it was like everything that you need when you get off a flight, you know, when you're just flying from city A to city B, you know, you get off and you're like, okay, I need restrooms. I need this. I need computer access. And these are people that were evacuated from Japan coming back to America. And it's like, can you imagine what they needed in that scenario? And so it's just a scramble of, hey, grab the stuff, run to the hangars, run to wherever they figure out they need to put someplace and let's throw all this stuff up. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So, um, I don't know. You want me to go to the next slide and talk about kind of like the long, seems like a good segue, right? To talk about yeah. kind of long-term versus short-term planning of, uh, of, you know, cause in that case you had no planning, right? You had no time to make a plan. You just ran over there with some gear and plugged some stuff in. Right. Right. And that's, and that's kind of, you know, but the idea is if you, if you use, especially if you use external antennas, you can change your coverage pattern by simply swapping out the antenna that you have on the top. You know, you can go from a patch antenna where you go, Hey, my net, all and I need to cover out in front of me to, oh, I need to, this is going to go up on a pedestal in the middle and I need to cover down. Then you can go out and you just swap kind of like you do on an AP on a stick survey, but you know, it's not, you're not surveying, you're actually running clients over it. And so, you know, that's the beauty of it. And so what you do is you try to plan for what's gives me the most flexibility. 
So that way, when you, if you have the long-term thought of, hey, we need to have this type of solution, and then your short-term thought is, okay, when I show up, I now have 45 minutes or an hour to, to swap, to, to adjust, to modify. Same, just like you would do if when you showed up, you know, you fly somewhere to do a, a survey. Same idea. It's the same thing. But with, you know, what we're looking at on this slide is more of, you know, the high density type of stuff and how you do to accommodate that, you know, the large sporting events, Super Bowl, Final Four, um, you know, those type of events that you think about uh, championship series, um, you pretty much know, yeah, the big game, you know, in advance, hey, we were going to have the Super Bowl and you generally know it's going to be in this, you know, town this year. And so you can start planning early and, you know, places like that, the superb owl, um, you can, <laughs> A lot of times, you off. <laughs> yes, a lot of times it's a, it's, you know, a mix of what's already there and then, oh, but because it's a big game and we can't have any type of fluctuations or outages, you know, they'll throw in some temporary stuff and they'll sort of combine what's existing and they'll merge those certain go, Hey, existing to a, a, uh, something that you're going to plan and you can kind of throw it in and that's how they do that stuff. Whereas conferences, you know, a lot of conferences know, um, you know, Hey, we know Cisco Live is going to be in Las Vegas next year. We know that Wi-Fi truck's going to be in Nashville. Last year was in San Diego. And so you have some time to plan, but you also only have a very short window to come in and set up. I mean, Black Hat's a good example, right? They, uh, Black Hat knows where it's going to be. They know when it's going to be, but they cannot use because, well, the location's smart enough to know not to let Black Hat on their on their normal network, they have to have their very own network. And so what they do is they sort of have this temporary, but not temporary setup to where they know, Hey, this is about what it's going to be. But when we go set up, we have two days between when the com when the facility lets us in and when we have to go live for classes because they just didn't pay, you know, they didn't rent the thing for the three weeks prior. So it's, it's, and I guess something like Cisco Live is probably pretty similar where they, they probably have, you know, either days or hours or something like that to get in there. Although I guess with Cisco Live, they also used a lot of existing uh, infrastructure that was on site, right? Well, yeah, but it, it, it all goes back to the it depends trademark yep. that, um, you know, it really depends. I mean, places like that, yeah, because I mean, Cisco Live, they took over one of the hotel's systems completely. Whereas, you know, Black Hat, everybody's like, ooh, no, no, hackers, hackers go away. You're not getting anywhere near my network. Turn off everything and run and hide while they're in town, you know. And then you have places like Wi-Fi Trek or WLPC that, you know, they might be going places, but they don't get to set up their own thing and they don't do it. And so they just use what what's existing. And I think we all learned that at this last WLPC that sometimes that's not a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I think too part of the thought process with something like uh, with like WLPC where they don't provide any infrastructure is it's very difficult to it's going to be very difficult to design and implement a network that makes all 300 Wi-Fi engineers at the same conference happy. It's a very <laughs> critical crowd. So, you know, that's uh, so I, I certainly understand what's going on. Can you can you talk about like the different types of clients or the different use cases for clients in different differing scenarios like, you know, one um, you, you know, like one use case, like one type of high density Wi-Fi versus another. Yeah. And it's, and it's funny. I just realized we probably should have used uh, or mentioned Mike Albano's website for the clients. Cause that's, that's a great source. It's a great place to go look at. And if you don't know about that website, I mean, yeah, it's, it, you do, if you have a question, you know, you start at Mike Albano's website, but and it'll, you can really take a look at what's the different capabilities. I mean, I'm on a MacBook right now and it's got three spatial streams and all of the, you know, fairly new. So it's got all the really cool stuff. But back at my desk, I have an uh, Amazon Fire 3 or whatever. I mean, one of the really old ones, it's 2.4 only. And so understanding that, understanding, you know, what is not only the intent of the people, but what type of devices are they bringing, right? You go to an education, you know, university, they have the big lecture halls or they're doing testing or any education facility that's doing testing where everybody brings their laptop or they set up a laptop in a big giant room and they have a thousand clients. You know, the laptops are going to have a different, they have different capabilities to transfer data. Um, I was talking to, um, to uh, uh, Roel about this and he said he's starting to see a lot of tests where they have to upload projects. And so now all of a sudden it's high density, 
which I think we can all agree, a thousand people in a space is fairly high density. Um, you need to have great reliability. You need to have all this great stuff. But now all of a sudden there's uploading, you know, you, and they can upload fast. They have the, they're plugged in. So battery's not an issue there. They'll do all that stuff. Whereas then you take a look at like the Super Bowl or the big game. I mean, how many people bring their laptops to the Super Bowl? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, have, every time I always take my MacBook, my 15 inch MacBook. Yeah. With so that. Andrews brings up uh, an interesting point, you know, obviously uh, in an airport, you're, you can't really control, you know, the devices obviously that are coming through and you need to, I would assume basically support, you know, any device that a, a client brings, or do you have a certain cutoff point of, you know, we're only going to support five gigahertz devices or um, certain data rates or, you know, those kinds of things, you know, what, how do you define that in your environment? Well, you know, unfortunately, and this is kind of what the, the whole thing of understanding that not all high density is the same, whereas, you know, in a transit location, you know, airports, train stations, bus stations, ferry terminals, cruise ship places. I mean, if you're if you're providing that's a question of, you know, who do you have to support? I mean, I remember the first time I realized, you know, years and years and years ago before I understood Wi-Fi and I thought I did when I got a call from somebody and they're like, oh, yeah, so and so's, you know, tablet doesn't work. And I'm like, what are they talking about? And I, I ended up hunting them down at their gate and kind of find out that their tablet was, you know, this old or old fire that only had five gig. And it's like, and they complain and they complain and it's everybody complains. You know, you only complain. Wait, it only had five gig or it only, or had, only, had, only had, only had 2.4. It didn't have wow, five. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's all of a sudden you're going great. Now I got to support that person because if not, they're going to complain. And then the boss is coming and ask you, you know, the phone rings, how come we're not supporting 2.4 because you know, so-and-so's sister couldn't use the Wi-Fi. And it's like, great. So for that's where it really becomes, you know, understanding the people, understanding um, the devices that they bring into your network, understanding what is the intent of the people, you know, can help you design. And so, you know, when you, when you take a look at a transit location, like an airport, we, just, we, you know, every, everybody that anything that you dig out of your, your closet minus 802.11 B only clients will support. So and you're not going to support my Palm Trio 650. Probably what not. You're saying? Oh, bummer. Can you talk so, about like kind of the different, like, um, I don't know, like the different use cases for like, you know, what, what people are using the Wi-Fi for. Does that impact like how you design a network? Oh, it, it actually, I think impacts it more than most people realize. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, what, like I said, not all data is the same. I mean, it, it, we like to compare it, but guess what? You, uh, it, it's great because it, you know, terabytes a terabyte, but is it, the, what type of terabyte is it? And I really think that we need to understand that when we design. So, you know, at bit at the big game, right? Nobody goes to the big game to download their Netflix movie onto their phone. You know, they're at the game. They're 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 sending out to posting to social media their their picture or their little ten second video clip of what happened, and they want people to know, hey, I'm here. And so they get heavy upload. Whereas, you know, in my facility, yeah, we get a little bit of that, but most of it's you know, hey, I'm getting on a metal tube at thirty thousand feet for the next five hours. I want to download as much Netflix as I can. So I'm entertained, you know, I, Oh, and then I got to get some movies for my kids. I got to get movies for the, you know, the wife wants this. And so the question really becomes, you know, what you do. And so when you understand that, you understand that in some places there is a, a big difference between the data you can design around that. And, you know, and I think, and we'll get to it here in a little bit, but, you know, but it really comes down to when we talk about stats, right? And let's go to the next slide. So when we talk about stats, this is something I started putting together actually after Cisco Live is the idea that not all data is the same. You know, we take a look at Cisco Live now this past, you know, month or so. It, and this comes from the, the one guy from the NOC who was tweeting stuff out. You know, they had 1,270 APs with 24,000 concurrent devices and in their five-day event they transported 80 terabytes of data and so as as kind of as a lark to compare it and go hey let's let's compare the data i said well at, at an airport during that same five-day event we had 754 ap's max concurrent was less than half um i can get my total unique count for that which was probably a little bit higher than the cisco live total unique count on their network and I transported 20 more terabytes of data. 
And all of a sudden you go, well, wait a second, what is that about? You know, because our peak throughput, I was just a little less. And so, you know, but the question becomes, because not all data is the same, what do you use it for? You know, when you come to an airport or a transit location, you want to download your data, you want to get your emails, you want to do, you want to do all this work before you're isolated for an hour, five hours, 12 hours, 18 hours. But then you, we compare that to Super Bowl 53, and this comes from the mobile sports report, um, guy by the name of Paul, uh, Paul Caps, I think. But he tweeted, he, you know, he wrote a report about Super Bowl 53 where they had 1,800 access points. They did 30,000, you know, concurrent users, which is more than Cisco Live, with only 48,000 unique, and they transported 24 terabytes. But the difference is when you take a look at the, the records from my my one day records of, you know, the 107,875, that was this past Monday, to be honest with you, 25 terabytes in one day, that was just a bit ago. And the peak throughput, 3.48, that was last month. But my data is different. The Super Bowl, remember, it's clients sending data up, whereas here, it's APs sending data down. And that's the difference. And so you need a lot more APs, 754 to 1800 to support that type of thing, even though the data transported is, I mean, you know, 1.5 terabyte difference. I mean, you know, I have a lot more clients, but they're not here as long. You know, my average time is that's and then they're out the door. I mean, you don't really like to hang out at airports for a long time. And so, you know, that's where you can start designing for is once you understand that stuff, you know, stadiums and high profile events, uplink heavy, you know, airports, train terminals, bus stations, anything like that, where it's like, I need to get that data. I need to get that content. And I'm going to store it because I'm going to go on, you know, I'm going to ground and you know, nobody's going to hear from me for, for hours or days sometimes. And so it, all of a sudden now you realize, Hey, in a downlink heavy, my APs that are, you know, my APs have really great antennas and really powerful and they, I don't have to worry about power and I can spatial streams and all that other things. If the majority of their time and the majority of their data is transmitting, why not take advantage of that? As you know, and so when you understand that, you can then take a look at something like this. And this is what we're talking about where in enterprise locations, universities, you really have kind of a, this balanced flow. I've seen, I've talked to people and they go, yeah, it's about, you know, 50% of my data is upload. 50% of my data is download. Um, we were talking to some guys about the Super Bowl one time and, and he was like, he was like, oh, you probably see the same thing we do, which is, you know, 80 to 80 to 90% upload and, you know, only a small amount download. And we went, I was like, no, actually we're exactly opposite. We are download heavy. We, our download is, you know, people downloading content is so much more. But the good thing is when I have an access point that's sending stuff out, he only needs to hear one act from the client to say, hey, I got those 50, you know, TCP packets of my Netflix movie. And so I can, I don't have to have the ability to receive a lot of that data from devices. You know, I got my phone here, then this is what I take to a, to an event and I'm trying to upload off of my crappy device. I need to have a lot more receivers to try to hear that data, all this data that's going up to the AP. I need to have a lot more receivers to pick that up because if not, then I don't, you know, all of a sudden the age, everything gets overwhelmed and I can't, I can't function anymore. And so when you understand these differences, when you understand that, what the what the intent of the client whether they're trying to do you can actually plan a little bit different that's why you know i can get by with what i'm doing with a lot less ap's than you could at say cisco live or you know the super bowl because all i got i got these big ap's with nice antennas you know antennas like this you know that are nice and clean and i got you know great signal and they're tested and everything like that and i just i just dump data straight down and they get their data, they get, you know, and then they're happy. Yeah. And speaking of antennas too, uh, I don't know, you want to talk about antennas for a couple minutes? You mean like the one I just held up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about around that antenna? So, you know, I get these questions all the time and, and this is, these are some pictures that I took the other day. Um, and, you know, on the right hand side is a, a patch antenna like you normally think about it. Oh, you know, we're going to mount it up here. We're going to point it down because we're trying to cover this area over here. But turns out patch antennas don't, 
you know, you can mount them other places other than a wall. And, you know, that little guy right there is a patch antenna that's pointed straight down. So instead of my antenna being kind of like this, my antenna is directly pointed down just like this. And so what that allows me to do is I can get these nice antennas and I can get them in. We'll, we'll see that here in a little bit where we can actually start to use patch antennas to gain my high density. And one of the things that I wanted to really focus on in this webinar was because people ask me all the time, they're like, what do you mean you're going to take a patch antenna and you're going to point it straight down? They're like, they're like, that's just ludicrous. Why would you do that? And so that's, you know, something that we're going to take a look at here in a little bit, but that's how, you know, and the other nice thing is, is, the aesthetics police, eh, they don't really see antennas like this. I've had people walk right past them and not see them. And people, I've had people come here looking for my antennas and they can't find them. And because they're not looking for this little antenna that's, you know, literally just this big. I mean, it's not that big. They're not looking for this. They're looking for an eight by eight AP with lights on it. And when they can't find it, they don't know what to do. And they're like, I can't find his APs. I don't know how he's doing great Wi-Fi because it works great, but I can't see anything. So how do I do that? How do I handle that? And so that's how we do it. And this one is an interesting antenna. This is um, from, this is actually TerraWave before Ven, you know, before the whole name changes and buying and selling and stuff like that. But what we're looking at here, and these are actually two different locations where we have a semi-hemispherical antenna. And Owing to my radio background, I'm a, I'm a giant n antenna nerd. I love antennas and you should too. Um, you know, you can still get better antennas than what comes built in, the internal antennas. And this antenna sort of mimics an internal antenna pattern. And it's, a, so the semi-hemispherical is instead of a, you know, a, it's not an omnidirectional because an omnidirectional, you got your, you got your, you know, your dipole antenna and the signal comes out like this and it's all nice around and when you add some gain to it it sort of collapses down and then the more gain the more it collapses out but it's still going you know you're losing you know your vertical um spread but when you take a look at the at a semi-hemispherical it actually takes that signal caps it on the top and creates almost like a bowl that comes out underneath like that and so you still get your 360 pattern. And depending on the amount of gain of that semi-hemispherical, the gain will pull that antenna pattern up. So if you have a multi-story facility and you need to try to pull that antenna gain, you know, because you all, all of a sudden you're bleeding through and you know you got your 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 20 story building and floor to floor and your channel plans all messed up and nobody can and you got co-channel and adjacent channel, you can use these semi-hemispherical antennas to actually pull the signal up, collapse it to keep it from going down the floors so cool well i think we're to that point where's my desktop there's the slides i think we're to that point where uh, do you have some stuff to demo for us using a certain uh, wireless design tool jim i might you might I'm, i might actually have i'll tell you what i'll do is i'm going to stop sharing my screen which you know is like seems like 50 percent of this webinar is just my desktop anyway uh, and uh let you uh let you take over there all right risky i know risky to let jim uh jim oh. take over screen sharing but we're gonna you're try letting me, you're letting me talk screen share and drive all at the it's, same time it's, it's is... risky but so far it's paying off you, well that's what you think <laughs> i don't I think the verdict is still out you have um, to pat your head and rub your stomach too wait how come chris is <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot we forgot to we forgot to kick chris out of here <laughs> All right, so um, this, as you can tell, we'll zoom out here a little bit. Um, this is an airport, part of an airport. Wow, I cannot scroll very well when I'm doing this. So we'll come down here. So here we go, we got some airplanes. And if you travel, you're probably familiar with something that looks very similar to this. Um, you know, and this is, these are called gatehold areas, just to kind of lay some groundwork for everybody. Um, this space that we have here is called a gatehold. This is where we park people before they get on their little jet bridge to get on whichever little plane or big plane that they want to take to go wherever they're going to go. And then we have a facility area in here. 
And as you can guess, we got some bathrooms and there's going to be some concessions over here and stuff like that. And so what becomes interesting is, you know, I've already, this is a project that I've been working on. And so I, I wanted to use this to kind of share. Um, so when you do your, your predictive design and you say, hey, I want to drop an antenna in and we'll use my favorite antenna actually, or my favorite AP and we're going to say, hey, we're going to drop an AP right there. And let's get out of here and you go, and I'm going to use actually use some antennas that I'm kind of familiar with so that I can, so we're going to come in here. We're actually going to change the pattern and we're going to use, oh, two, and I just, I use these because I have them memorized. Is this, is this the every man? No, we're actually going to, we're not going to do the every man. We're going to, we'll get to that guy here in a second. But what I want to show is that we're going to use one of these different antennas. And this is hopefully something that they're working on where I don't have to switch the antennas twice. They fixed all my other problems. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. Are we, gonna... we don't want to make it too easy on you, Joe. No. <laughs> how are you, how, how you, you wouldn't be the expert anymore if it was easy. We have to make it still kind of difficult, right? So the cool that part one. is, right? So this type of antenna, what we're looking at is a semi-hemispherical antenna. Um, and when you put it in with a, with a zero degree down tilt, what we're looking at here, hopefully everybody's sort of aware of this screen. What will happen is Ekahau has been nice enough to say, hey, that antenna is going to sit on the ceiling and it's going to point down. So that's kind of the it, that's its natural orientation. So that's what how it gives us. Now, the cool part is, is if you notice, if you saw before, this was a minus 90. When I made the change on radio two, now when I go to radio one, uh, look at that. It's now, you know, it's, it, it switched itself. So great. Now I'm, now I can go back and I can look at my, my signal here and we can say, Hey, you know, I got my one simulated AP and he's at six feet off the ground and he's covering all the way from, this corner all the way back to here. And when we measure this, you go, hey, do, 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 do. 345 feet is my cell coverage. <laughs> and that's to a minus 64. So if, you've, if, you're, if you're new, you don't want this. If you're not new, you know you don't want this. So what we're gonna do, and this is what I love about doing external antennas, is I don't like that antenna. So I'm gonna come in here we're going to switch from my omnidirectionals, my semi-hemispherical. We're going to go to the Everyman antenna. And the Everyman antenna was named by um, Mitch Dickey. Rue Mitch actually named this the Everyman antenna because nice. it's, um, it's actually very... Great, now we got to pay him some royalties. Is that what you're saying? Probably, <laughs> yes. That's okay. <laughs> He's probably not paying attention, so we can get away with not paying him for a while. <laughs> nice. So now that we've switched it, now what you'll see is, oh, in the background, I don't know if it all of a sudden went from green to gray. But more importantly, what we're looking at here is on the down tilt, right? So what this is showing us is an antenna that's a patch mounted on the wall at six mm -hmm. feet tall. But it's pointing directly, you know, perpendicular to the wall. Here's the, what would be the ceiling. Here's the wall. So we know our signal is going straight out. And so if you said, hey, I'm going to go eight feet up on a wall, 10 feet up on the wall, and I'm going to cover a space down in front of me, and we'll say, hey, let's do a minus 20. You can watch that pattern shift, right? Hey, Jim, you know, can you uh, explain that six feet real quick? I saw a question in chat, and I just want to make sure people understand what that's defining. That's defining how far from the floor of your plan, you know, the, the little floor plan that we have back here, from the floor up to the height of the antenna. So the little dot, yep, that's, that's what that symbol means is, you know, how far from the floor are you mounting this? And in certain areas, you don't have, you know, eight foot ceilings. You know, you get, especially in large public venues, everybody likes to have these really wide open, you know, open space with lots of it, sunlight and all of a sudden your ability to mount places is really limited because they go, Oh, this entire South wall is going to be nothing but glass. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's 22 feet glass from the, from the floor 
all the way up to the ceiling is 22 feet high and it's just a glass wall and you can't mount to it. And you're like, great, where do I mount? And so what you can do with these patch antennas is, well, you can use a little bit of more down tilt on here. We'll go like that. And the cool part is, is that we've been adjusting the five gig radio. Oh, look at that. It adjusted on the two four as well. I, I love the antenna linking well, feature. I'm so well, happy that, well, go ask your folks, go ask your folks where the antenna linking came from and then you, you can take credit after that. <laughs> anyway, what I want to, what we'll do is we're, let's drop this right here for a second. So remember this gate hold space where when we cram, you know, look at, we got one, two, three, four, five, five gates, 150 people per plane, five gates, you know, six to 700 people that are waiting to get on the plane. And then when all the people that get off the plane, there's another 600 people and you can have 1200 people in this space. And, it's, and so when we cram that many people into such small square footage, you know, we want the open space and the high ceilings to make you feel like you're not cramming into a, a cattle car. But guess what this is now I have myself some walls. So instead of putting here in the middle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my access point. I'm going to drag it over here against the wall. And remember, this is a 30 degree down tilt. So we'll come in, we'll say, hey, let's, I don't want six feet because people are going to hit it. Let's do, nine, six, no, let's do nine feet off the ground with a 30 degree down tilt. Oh, look, it changed there too. So now that we have that, we'll come in, we'll show the signal strength. So now all of a sudden you can see that we've been able to sort of pull that back. We've been able to say, I just want to cover this area. I'm still reaching a little bit farther than I want. So what the architects gave me in this particular design is in between this post and this post, there's actually a, a beam. And so I can take my antenna and I can move it in between. And I'm going to do something here. See, I'm still, I'm still, it still thinks I'm on a wall, but now I'm going to put it in a ceiling. But on the ceiling, I can't be a 30 degree down tilt. I'm actually going to be a 90 degree down tilt and watch what it does to the pattern. It actually points that guy straight down. If you saw the signal back here changed. And so when we close it, look at that. Now all of a sudden, my, my want signal has completely changed from something that I don't, you know, that, that now I was like, now I can do something with this. Now I can, I can plan around this. I can, I can, I can do something. And if you, what I want to show is let's say, let's take this thing out here. And this is what a patch antenna looks like when you point it straight down, you actually end up with a rectangle signal. Now say, say you want to take this antenna and I'll have to switch back over to my camera here in a second. Um, but what if I don't want my signal to go this way? What if I'm like, oh, I just need coverage. Let's take that guy. Let's rotate it 90 degrees. Watch what happens. <laughs> Makes a big difference. That's a huge difference. And now all of a sudden, so this is, this is the fun part about so external. And just to make sure everybody understands what you're doing there. You've got the antenna still uh, next to you. You want to show us on the, uh, the camera of what you're doing uh, in simulation here. Yeah. So can, can you guys see me? I don't know if my camera's still active. Yeah. Yeah. I can on. see it small. Okay. But let's, see, let's can we spotlight the video? I don't know if that makes it bigger or not. I'm going to kill your sharing so that you're okay. So now you're full screen. All right. So this is an every man antenna that I had sitting at my desk. Um, and it's set up to normally be mounted on a wall. So here's my wall like this. And we said, hey, we want a 30 degree down tilt. And so that's about a 30 degree down tilt. And the brackets that come with these things are actually pretty flexible so you can do stuff with them. And so that's a 30 degree down tilt on a wall. Now, when you put it on a ceiling, what happens is instead of being a 30 degree down tilt, we're actually going to do a 90 degree down tilt, just like this. And so it's pointing straight down at the ground. So a lot of people always ask me, they go, well, how do you know which way it's pointing? Because this doesn't, you know, it's like, well, how do I get the rectangle part? Well, patch antennas generally will have little points on here that says, hey, this arrow is up. So when you take a patch antenna like this and you mount it pointing straight down with a, 90, a neg 90 
down tilt on it and you're like this, this arrow that's right here, we'll show it right there, that arrow now all of a sudden becomes, now let's go back to, um, you're going to have to share your screen again because yeah, I killed it I'm, to make you. I'm perfect. working on it. You're on it. Awesome. We're, make, we're really making Jim work uh, on this webinar. Are, are, why are you here, by the way? So anyway. I think I'm just going <laughs> to randomly just disable his screen sharing just to mess with him. So what we're looking at right now is my arrow that we had at the top is actually pointed. This arrow here on the, on the AP, these two arrows right here are actually the arrows that are on the top of the antenna. So if I take this thing and I rotate it in Ekahau and I rotate it in my hand, all of a sudden my pattern changes from, it's still a rectangle, but what direction the sides of the rectangle go are rotated by simply rotating the antenna 90 degrees. And if you wanted to cover, you could you know rotate it 45 degrees and have it set like this. Now I'll get your coverage now. Hmm. So how do you ensure, yeah, is that a challenge at all from like an installation standpoint then to make sure the installers are, you know, that seems like a lot of detail to make sure that they get correct. Oh, it's, it's a lot of work, but that's sort of the difference between I can do that because I'm here. Yeah. When you, you know, this is, this idea is a little bit harder when you go, you know, you go to like the black hats or the, you know, atmospheres or any of those conferences because you don't have as much time. So it makes it a lot harder. So this type of design isn't normally used in those areas because that, then you got to get the thing, you know, mounted in a ceiling, which all of a sudden you don't have time for that. You don't have the budget for that. So in a places where you can spend the time and you can plan it and you can fix it, this is a, a technique that you can use and you can, you can change it. And the cool part is, you know, if we take our AP that, right now is at nine feet and we go, oh, by the way, we have no horizontal spaces here. Let's take it and go, you get to put it up in a 22 foot high ceiling right there. So our height on our 2.4, oh, look, the height on our five gig radio still is the same. I love it. Um, <laughs> Turns out making Jim happy is really easy. It kind of is actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now what you'll see though is, is that I'm now a little bit more spread out. And so what I like to do, what I want to do is I want to try to bring this spread from the edge of my neg. I think, we're, yeah, we're at a neg 64 right here. Bring that edge of the cell and this edge of the cell. I want to try to bring them together. So what you can do is you can actually, if you change the antenna, we're going to go from this antenna, we're going to go to a high density patch antenna. So 2.4, got to make sure this one I don't use as much. So one comment I would also make that, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious, Jim, how this plays in with especially your RF, you know, knowledge and background is, you know, we're looking at this from the transmit side of things, but the other side of the, you know, change of this antenna is it's bi-directional, right? So this is going to change what the AP or what the antenna hears as well. And especially in a dense environment, high capacity uh, deployments, you know, you want to limit how much that uh, antenna can hear, right? From neighboring access points and other clients and things like that, that you don't want that AP to hear. You know, and that's where you start, you know, kind of going into the RXSOP stuff and there's some other things that you can tweak and try to do. But more importantly, you know, I was talking about this yesterday. Everybody knows that airport Wi-Fi is bad, right? I mean, I think everybody in the chat, everybody on the call, everybody can agree that airport Wi-Fi just is terrible. And so I don't have to get, to supremely awesome like you would in say, you know, a corporate office building. I just have to get better than, than terrible. And so I can, I have some fudge factor. I have the ability to do what I do because of a mix of expectations, clients, what they're doing. And so I can, I can, I can buy it a little bit better, but that's why when you design for other high density environments like stadiums, you know, where, where all of a sudden, you know, you have what's being transmitted and, the data that's being transmitted and what's transmitting it changes. Now you have to increase the number of APs so that you can really try to contain your cell and not hear everything that's being, being broadcast. But, you know, like I said, you can change your 
your antenna. And by simply changing your antenna, it's almost like changing the AP itself. And now this becomes important when you actually go to deploy it and you go, oh, I have, if you use internal antenna APs and all of a sudden I got to buy a new and a new AP because, oh, I, that didn't work out the way. Well, all of a sudden now I'm stuck with, now I got to buy a whole brand new AP. Whereas if I have to buy a new antenna, antennas are much cheaper than an AP. And so my hit to my, my profit margin on a, on a project like that is a lot less. Hmm. That's a good point. So are there any other questions that we want to talk about? I think there's probably a load of questions. What do you think, Jerry? Should we, uh, should we move into uh, Q and a now? Yeah. I mean, Jim, I think that pretty well covered all the content uh, we had in the slide deck. We've got plenty of questions and you know, we're already, uh, you know, at that Q and a time, Mark, should we uh, move on to Q and a, or do you have anything else you want to talk about? No, we can go to Q and a, I'm just going to kind of keep playing here while I'm doing this and we can, watch how adjusting the height. So I do have to uh, apologize. Uh, this has been too interesting of a webinar that I have not been, uh, I've been neglecting the, the Q and A. So uh, yeah, I, I haven't I, been paying attention at all <laughs> in there. So this is, uh, I'll get caught up here on the, uh, the questions, but yes, go ahead and locate that question pane. If you haven't uh, been in there already, there's several really good questions in there. You can upvote them. You can add questions if you don't see your question already asked. Um, but, uh, yeah, and actually there's been some really good, uh, dialogue in the Q and a, uh, window from our, uh, from our attendees already. So it's been, uh, it's been a very interesting, uh, topic. Apparently this is a very relevant topic to our uh, attendees. When are um, we just going to start just sending Chris paychecks? I think we need to do that because we've been doing all of our work. I was in here just, just drooling and listening to, to Jim talk about stuff and not paying attention to this. And meanwhile, Chris was in here just taking care of it. No. Nope. Awesome. Taking care of business. That's right. <laughs> Appreciate it, Chris. Um, so yeah, actually the most upvoted question, let's uh, start there. So this is around campus Wi-Fi and supporting VoIP uh, over Wi-Fi. So uh, do you know of any, uh, I guess, Jim, I'm kind of curious, have you done anything with like voice over Wi-Fi? Uh, I can't imagine you guys are doing that in your environment. Um, do you have any uh, special, uh, yeah, any experience with that? Any special considerations to consider when doing uh, like a campus-wide uh, VoIP over Wi-Fi deployment? You know, and, and this has been a conversation that's come up a lot on the Slack channels and other type of social media stuff about, you know, how do how do you do that kind of stuff? And I and I think defining it goes back to defining the requirements. You know, a lot of people say you know Wi-Fi calling or VoIP, and it's like, well, is it a dedicated handset? Like you know like you see in hospitals or is it, Hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a traveler and I don't have good cell coverage. So I'm going to use my phone on the Wi-Fi signal to get out, you know, and, uh, you know, and that's really what drives the question. And in my experience, you know, it, it drastically changes to the point where if it's a dedicated phone, then you have to do your normal designs and you have to go in and you have to say, Hey, I don't want just basic connectivity anymore. You know, down here in my profile, I want an actual, you know, I'm going to do it for a VoIP. And so, whereas in a place like mine, it's best effort. You know, if your phone works, great. If, you, if you're connected and you're sitting down here in one of these seats that they haven't put on the plan yet, waiting for your flight, and you're connected, it's going to work fine just by having general basic connectivity because it doesn't really require a lot. And when you roam, eh, good luck on you. But for, you know, in, in large public venues, when you're doing this type of high density stuff, the idea that you'll be able to roam back and forth is almost, a, the, the two use cases almost don't fit together and, and we don't support it here. You know, and, and, and yeah, you, if you can make a call if you're sitting, but if you get up and you want to keep that call going as you roam, it may or may not work. Yeah. Well, and I think capacity becomes a big uh, constraint, right? Because, you know, voice is a very uh, latency dependent, you know, to, to be able to support good VoIP uh, yeah, services, um, latency is a, is a critical factor there. And um, yeah, the more devices that you get on these APs, the more contention, um, you know, that's going to be created. So capacity becomes a big factor in making sure your APs aren't becoming overloaded. Um, I've done some work in the, uh, the, the voice over Wi-Fi space, not so much uh, on the high density side that obviously adds another element to it but uh, in like healthcare and yeah it, it actually kind of contradict when you're doing voice over wi-fi it kind of goes against the grain when it comes to 
uh, all the regular high performance Wi-Fi best practices and those kinds of things. And Chris actually linked to a really good article um, uh, with a podcast with Andrew uh, McHale. And uh, I would say he's got the best, uh, you know, advice and presentations out there. I know he's even presented at uh, conferences like WLPC um, on voice over Wi-Fi. And uh, I learned a ton listening to that. So yeah, if you're doing any kind of voice over Wi-Fi type stuff or looking to do it, definitely check out some of the uh, stuff that uh, Andrew has produced and uh, that link that Chris uh, linked in the, uh, the Q&A there. Um, so another question actually overtook the VoIP question with upvotes. So I think maybe we should, uh, and I think it's very pertinent to this webinar. Nick asks, how do you design differently for the different flow types? In other words, download heavy versus upload heavy. How do you design for the differences? So it goes back to the slide we had with the three different um, the APs and the three different loads in a, in a download heavy environment like I am where and I think there was even a slide about showing what our utilization has been over the past uh, um, week. Do, you, do we have that slide? Yeah, we do. And it keeps yeah, going to my go. desktop instead of, uh, da, 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 da. there we go. I figured out how to use a computer. <laughs> so this is, I actually pulled this uh, two days ago um, with the idea that, you know, the green lines we have here is download, blue is upload. And so you can see that vast difference between the two things. And so when, when you're in an environment like this, green is download, blue is upload. The, the client says, hey, Mr. Netflix server, I want to download season one of House of Cards because I'm getting on a really long flight and I need lots of video content, I want lots of media. So he sends this really small request that goes you know, up to the AP. And so I go, oh, there's my request to download Netflix. And then that gets forwarded out to the Netflix Netflix server, which then says, oh, season one, House of Cards is, you know, so many gigs or whatever it is. I don't know. But what happens is all of this data just starts get, starts flowing down and flowing down and flowing down. So I usually, I take advantage of the AP having a better antenna, better transmit power. And all the all my little phone doing is doing at this point is just receiving all this data. And because it's coming in at such a strong signal, because it's so much better, then it receives it better. And I can get away with having 700 APs versus 1800 APs because with 1800 APs listening to all of, you know, my little crappy minus two DB, you know, pad antenna that's on my phone that's trying to transmit all this data up. I need to have a lot more receivers. And this is a, this is a radio fundamental uh, problem that we've had. Um, we actually did a project when I was still doing two way radio where we added extra receivers into our air to ground system so that the little crappy planes that nobody likes to fly on, you know, the little single aisle turboprop plane that holds 20 people. Turns out the radios that the pilots use on that thing is really, really bad as compared to say a nice brand new, you know, A350 or Boeing 787 has really nice radios. And so when those nice radios transmit, our system could hear them really well. Well, but when the little crappy, you know, crop duster planes would come in, their little crappy radios could, and the controllers just couldn't hear them because their transmitter was so bad, their antenna was so bad, none of the stuff was maintained. So what we did is we actually put out external receivers and we just put them out all over the airfield. And when that audio would come in, it would then, t we would pump it back into a system that would pick, hey, what's the best audio that we heard? Because my big antenna can transmit down to them and they can hear that. But I needed it. I needed some additional receivers, some auxiliary receivers set up to be able to hear that. And so when you have 1800 APs in a, in the Super Bowl, a lot of that is so that your minus one DB pad antenna that's on your phone can actually work because it's, it's not getting a great transmit signal and you're really limiting your ability to talk. Did I answer the question? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know, but it was really interesting. So <laughs> I think it works. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, maybe not a super specific answer, but I think that's totally fine. That's fascinating stuff for sure. Um, Timothy has a question. Uh, what's your ideal clients per AP in a typical high density environment? <laughs> um, one, one client. You know, turns out that if you remove rate limiting, um, you can you can get away with a lot more. Because so, so you mean throughput 
limiting? Yeah, you, you, if you remove the rate limiting, I mean, we had an operational issue happen yesterday and I had an AP that had 180 clients on it and everybody was happy because it turns out it wasn't 180 laptops, it was 180 phones. And so the amount of data that you, because now Netflix knows, oh, it's going to, you know, a phone and it says, so I don't have to send as big a frame, I have big a file. I don't have to send the 1080p, you know, 4K ultra high definition file. I'm sending a little file. So it doesn't have to send as much. And it, when your point is, is, hey, I'm having an operational issue and I'm, I'm out there on social media and I'm tweeting and I'm going, hey, what's going on? What's going on? And call this person and, and send a text message. It's not using as much data. So all of a sudden I can oversubscribe my access points and I routinely get you know, 140 clients on an access point and it's doing okay. It's churning along because without the rate limit, they get on and then they get off. I don't know if anybody saw my WLPC presentation about Netflix, but when you want to have very bursty traffic, you want it to just hit, 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 and open up the white space in between that white space is where you can, where you can live because white space in our world is not being utilized. And if you can get data white space, then all of a sudden, yeah, you have 150 clients, but if they're not doing anything because they already have their content, sure, have 150 clients. AX, you have what, 5,000 clients now on an AXAP or whatever stupid number they've come up with? Sure, why not? If they're not doing anything, have 5,000 clients on your, tab on your table. It doesn't matter to me. Nice, thanks, Jim. Uh Another question here, a uh, question to Jim, are you, are you the only one allowed to put APs in the insert airport name here, or is it total mayhem in the shopping areas? Monopoly is great, but not always possible. How do you guys handle that? Jerry actually did this. He did a little <laughs> test for me a couple months ago. What, what did you find, Jerry? Yeah, there was a, there was a few uh, different APs uh, around. Yeah, we, uh, we were doing some beta testing with, uh, actually this was prior to launching the iPad app and uh, wanted to test uh, the iPad to make sure that it wasn't going to crumble in some really dense AP environments and uh, talked to Jim and said, hey, do you have any uh, areas where I can, you know, hear a lot of APs standing in, you know, one location? And uh, yeah, he had, a, he had a, it just a spot picked out for me and we went over to that area and, uh, you know, it was a big open um, uh, area of the, 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 the building and you could, you know, hear the APs from the floor above and below and there's, you know, uh, different um, shops and vendors and all that kind of stuff in that area. So, uh, yeah, we were picking up all sorts of different uh, equipment in, the, in those areas. So, uh, I can attest firsthand that uh, Jim is not the only one that uh, uh, can put APs up in the uh, location. So, to, so, I think Jerry told me that the number he came back is he saw 220 transmitters in the space that's 175 feet by 175 feet. So, you know, you tell me, but the way you, and Keith Parsons says this, he says, you can fix bad RF with big pipes. So one of the ways that we overcome working in a high RF or challenging RF environment is, you know, we increase, you know, by removing the rate limit, we already have a hard enough time on the air. Why are we going to go ahead and add another way to slow us down on the wire? You know, in a bad RF environment, you can't have the wire slowing you down too. That's just, that's just insane. You can't do it. And so you can overcome a lot of this stuff and come to find out, you know, if you go back to the stats page, oh, we can do 12,000 clients on an unrate, unrate limited system and only use three point, you know, eight or no, I think we're up to four gigabits per second peak ever period. Never use more than four gig by rate limit. I bet you I can get it to eight or 10 or more, but that's how you accomplish it. Cool. Um, going right down the list of questions here. And I don't know, we've probably got time for, I think maybe three more questions and then we should probably wrap it up since we're about five minutes after the top of the hour. Um, question from Dan, Dan is, uh, am I right in assuming that, uh, that UBNT stuff is good enough to run high density in, e in an EDU environment with 200 plus APs? So Dan, I think I'd first start off by just saying that we're friends with all of the, all the Wi-Fi infrastructure vendors out there, whether it's Ubiquity or Mist or Aero, Aero Extreme or, you know, whoever. Uh, we're friends with all of them. And the way that I see it is I think that every Wi-Fi infrastructure vendor out there has a unique value proposition. You know, uh, everybody has a different strength. 
And whether ubiquity is, you know, quote unquote, good enough for something like really high density like that, I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, I've used ubiquity in a number of environments, nothing quite that dense, had good luck with them. But uh, I think, uh, I, I think it just depends on what you need and, uh, and what value proposition that particular vendor brings to the table. I don't know, Jerry, Jim, well, any the, additional thoughts there? Add, uh, I'll be curious if Jim uh, agrees with this, but you know, at the end of the day, RF is RF, right? I think, yes. I think you even said that, uh, you know, throughout the, the webinar here is, you know, you still have physics that apply. It doesn't matter who the vendor is. You still have, uh, you know, contention in the air and all these other things. So, yeah, I mean, that's really, I think the bigger factor there. I mean, certainly different vendors have different kind of secret sauce things and different things that can help in high density situations. But at the end of the day, if it's not planned correctly, if you're not using proper antennas and, um, you know, designing the RF properly, it's going to, you know, it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would agree with that. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, it's 100%. I mean, and you know, the other thing is, is it then becomes when you have a lot of clients like that, it's a, it's what's the, the chipset inside the, the AP capable of doing, yeah. you know, and, and you can look at the specs of an AP and go, Hey, I'm going to compare, you know, ubiquity to, you know, Cisco to Ruby to all the different vendors. And you say, Hey, what's, what is, what is this thing built of? What, you know, what does it have? And you can sort of, you can sort of look at it, but I mean, quite honestly, when you start getting into areas like this, it's there's nothing. Yeah. You you know what, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to put in the wrong AP and, and it, and it just happens because when you're hurting wild cats, that is, you know, large public venues, cause you don't know who's going to show up and what they're going to want to do. It's, it's really it's some trial and error involved. I've seen many cases where a bad design led to poor performing Wi-Fi. I personally, and this probably is not universally true, but I personally have never seen a case where the wrong vendor uh, meant poor, poor performing Wi-Fi. I've, I've never seen that. It's, it's just not like that. It's, it's not, not in my not experience. Even, maybe, maybe 10, 12 years ago, but you know, in the past couple of years, I, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Uh, question from Joe. We have a high, we have a high density of access points in a warehouse, but not necessarily high density for clients. Most of the APs have external antennas and are running dual five gigahertz radios. Is it wise to disable one of the five gigahertz radios to reduce uh, co-channel contention and overlap? I would be curious to know why the choice to go with dual five gig. I mean, if you don't have, if you don't, if you have a lot of APs, but you don't have a whole lot of clients, what do you gain by having the, the second radio? So one thing I have seen in warehouse, which, uh, you know, I don't know if Joe is still on, if he can clarify that, but um, uh, some things that are interesting of use cases with dual five in a warehouse is, you know, with the external antenna concept of uh, using, uh, you know, ex essentially using fewer APs to cover a larger area, right? Because you could have two different directional antennas, uh, pointed in two different uh, locations or directions, or you could have a directional antenna facing one way where you have an omnidirectional, you know, maybe facing more down. Um, so that way you can, uh, yeah, use less antennas to cover a larger area. So kind of reduce that AP d density potentially. But yes, I would agree. Typically when we think of dual five, we think of dual five for client density purposes and smaller cell sizes. But uh, I've seen some interesting developments, you know, using these external antennas uh, with these dual five APs. And, you know, it's funny when I, when I talk about this stuff and I start talking about, I, I stop thinking about the AP as being, you know, when you say I have a high dense AP, I don't think about the actual radio itself. I think about the antennas because at this level, that's really what matters. Right. And so if you have a whole lot of antennas, but you know, they're in the radio, you have to kind of separate it two different bands, two different things, two different, then yeah. And Joe's saying that it's two antennas. Um, I think, you know, I think, Sure. I mean, at that point, you go, what are the antennas doing? Are you getting signal to where you want and keeping it from where you don't want? Because that's the end of the day. That's what you do with external antennas. I want the signal where I want it. And I want to make sure it's not going where I don't want it. And so you could, you could get away with it. It's, you know, but do you need it is the question. And that's where doing profiles and, and planning and surveys, you can learn a lot about, do you, I really need that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting one. The whole dual five thing certainly opens up some new use cases and even those types of uh, density, uh, those high density environments and high density in the 
sense of APs, but not clients, which is an interesting, you know, another kind of scenario of high density that we didn't even really get into in this of you can have high density APs for the purpose of covering a large area and maybe dense in the sense that there's a lot of metal and things like that that you have to cover with RF, but you may only have, you know, minimal number of clients uh, that need to associate to that AP at a time. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, we should probably, we're about uh, 11 minutes past the top of the hour. So we should probably go ahead and wrap this one up. Now there were a lot of excellent questions here that unfortunately we did not have time to get to. Uh, Jerry and I, uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I think Jerry probably is too. And so feel free to drop us a line. If there's a question that we didn't get answered here, if you want to dialogue with us. Uh, also be sure to look, uh, look up Jim on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, he posts a lot of great stuff there. Uh, most of it's about Oreos, to be honest, most of it's about <laughs> Oreos and not Wi-Fi. but if you want to know more about Oreos than, uh, than, than, uh, oh, sorry. Um, sandwich cookies. No, uh, no. remember they're, they're now Eka cookies. Eka cookies. cookies. That's we right. Have, we have Eka hats. Now there's You're introducing the Eka cookie, which hashtag. Is <laughs> Hashtag Eka cookie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna New product. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. So uh, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. Um, if, uh, if you have more questions or shoot uh, either Jerry or myself an email and we would be more than happy to chat with you some more. So uh, I don't know, Jim, any closing thoughts or anything before we get out of here? Don't be afraid of antennas. Use the tools and you can swap out antennas so much easier in the, in the software than you can climbing up on in scissor lifts. Nice. All right. Well, with that, I think it's time to end. Hey, everybody, thanks for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us and talk about uh, talk about this technical stuff. We really enjoy it. We hope you enjoy it too. And uh, we'll post this uh, video on our website and on our YouTube channel within about 24 hours. So keep an eye out for that. And we will see you on a future Ekahal webinar. Bye now. <laughs>